If there's one thing the internet's come to know about Xenoblade Chronicles fans, it's that we will never stop talking about Xenoblade Chronicles. Hey everyone, it's Yggdrasil, and welcome back to another Xenoblade Chronicles 3 analysis video. I know it's been a hot minute already since the game was announced, and people are probably tapering off the hype until maybe E3. That said, there's been a few new tidbits of information, mostly brought up by Nintendo of Japan, that I want to bring to your attention. I also want to provide a few points of correction for my almost 40 minute long video, which is mostly still relevant and I would encourage you to watch. Similar to that video, I will not be bringing up anything that is Xenogears or Xenosaga related, but I will again be bringing up spoilers for all of the Xenoblade Chronicles games. If you want to play any of these games yourselves before Xenoblade Chronicles 3 is released, I would recommend you not to watch this video, but maybe consider watch my 10 minute Geek Out Session 1 instead, where I'm more hushy hush on things. Lastly, I'm also going to be talking about a few more fan theories that have popped up, including a personal fan theory of mine that really only myself and a handful of people have brought up, so stick with me to the end of the video for that one. Let's get started. First up, the quickest correction there is, I said ether had been seen in all games as physical, solid, and liquid, obviously I meant to say solid, liquid, and gas as in the previous games. Just as a quick correction, let's move on. Now I said that these nop on here remind me a lot about Rex and Pyra, but there are a couple things I want to bring up. Some people are confused about the Pyro reference because it sure doesn't look fully similar and the hair is obviously different. If this is a reference, it's more akin to the first concept drafts of Pyra, also called Beta Pyra by fans, where she sports a lighter toned hair color and twin tails. The second is more or less an update on the fan theory and has two details about the eyes. Note that both Nopon's eyes are much larger and even more human shaped as compared to previous Xenoblade entries. It's almost uncanny and a little offsetting compared to the pure black sparkly eyes we've seen on the Nopon so far. But that detail also lets us see that the Rex-like Nopon has blue eyes, which can take away from the Rex insert fan theory since Rex has the vivid and almost entirely unique golden eye color in Xenoblade Chronicles 2. We can also see the girl's eye colors, a variant of brown as compared to Pyra's red eyes, in fact closely resembling Nene's from Xenoblade Chronicles Future Connected. Same with her fur color. Lastly with these two, Nintendo of Japan revealed their names as Riku and Manana. Nana could perhaps yet be another link to Nene given the two similar features and now with the name Manana closely sounding similar to Nene, but if that's the case, the lighter clothing could throw us all off because she clearly seems to be on the Agna side of things. I'm just gonna have to put this off in the original reincarnation fan theory side and, you know, just maybe it's a callback or a small easter egg or something for now. I also really just hope that the guy's wearing a wig, please, I, it's just still offsetting me so much. Let's just leave it at that. Now I briefly talked about the motes of light that appear when offseers are performing. I failed to bring up however that these motes are the main design change on the Xenoblade Chronicles 3 logo, as each different game has their own adjustments to the logo for their respective game. Xenoblade 1 had it written out so that the paint was set to illustrate the symbols of the Monado. Xenoblade X had cracks and fragments left behind by a bullet because you know we all need a bigger gun. Xenoblade 2 had flames to represent Pyra's flames. Xenoblade 3 however has these motes of light, extremely similar to particles spewing out of fog beasts in the Fog King from Future Connected, which is alluding to dark hints and premonitions that the game foresaw. One last thing about these particles is they could allude to being motes of life, and that the Offseer role may have been hinted and seen all the way back at the start of Xenoblade Chronicles 1. This is just something that I'm going to be pointing out. I haven't seen it talked about anywhere else, but you know, in Tefra Cave, Shulk and Rhine come across the bodies of dead travelers, and they opt to bury them. At this point, Rhine says what's born from the Bionis is returned to the Bionis, or more specifically, as we would know later on in that game, their ether. Maybe these modes could be the ether of the fallen after a big battle has occurred, and that allows them to be brought back in some way. Who knows, just my theory. Anyway, let's move on. While talking about Uni, I failed to talk about the darker hair and wing color that showed up in several of the clips. Many people have speculated that it's more than just a trick of the light, as her splash art very clearly shows blonde hair with light wings. The shade or dark surroundings she's in in some of these clips don't quite justify how darkened her wings are, leading some to conclude that her wings and hair can change color, either maybe her own choice, or maybe she's dyeing them, I don't know, or perhaps it's something to do with her bloodline. Speaking of which, Enel was quick to point out that her hair is extremely unique in that she's the first Hyantia we've seen to have a hair color that is not either white or silver. 
It was a really good point that I failed to even consider, so I wanted just to express that here. The dark hair color and the rough language may allude to a little Ryan and Charla lovin', though I don't know how the bird got thrown in the mix. Eh, who knows, let's move on. In this clip right here, Mio is seen doing a diving animation, and it almost seems specifically cut before going to the next part of the trailer. Many are wondering if this is indicative of an actual diving mechanic, and while it's very cool to have, I personally cannot see this as being a new mechanic for several reasons. One, only Mio does this animation, and it could be intentional. The cast of Xenoblade Chronicles 2 all had very unique swimming animations. Many may recall Nia's kitty paddling or Morag's uniform motions. It could just be that this is a unique part of the animation, and they chose to end the segment on the last clip of her animation there. The second reason is that only Mio is performing this animation. It could just be that only the leader of the party does it, or if, like I said, everyone has a unique animation, the party members just aren't synchronized in performing their animations at exactly the same time. Third, if a brand new mechanic such as diving existed, it would imply that there will be both be monsters and collectibles underwater, as well as potentially breathing timers or similar mechanics that correlate to underwater explorations in most other games that also feature underwater areas. This part is more or less that if Malasoft wanted to do this kind of thing, I have no doubt they would pull it off. And lastly, as a brand new kind of mechanic, completely not in any other Xenoblade game, I have no doubt at all it would have been showcased as a clip of the characters underwater in their exploration segment. This is the kind of feature that would have people popping off in even more discussion. It may not be back of the box kind of large news like the Skells were in Xenoblade Chronicles X, but it'd still be something that could have generated even more hype in this already magnificent and chock full trailer. Alright, now with the corrections and further speculations about stuff we knew out of the way, let's talk about the things we didn't know. For a couple days after the trailer's release, Nintendo was posting information daily about the game's world and characters. And while Nintendo of America and Europe have excluded some details, the Japanese release on Twitter have been very keen to hand out nice and juicy tidbits of info, specifically things like character age. Many people have turned to translating the tweets from Nintendo of Japan, and have tried my best to look out for the most accurate and consistent translations. For these, I'd highly recommend following at Xenoblade EN, an unofficial Twitter account run by Aegis Floral and Rose Translating. I'll also be putting up this wonderful chart designed and translated by Milliam Man, which wonderfully sets up pretty much all the known character relations and the basic info that Nintendo Japan has released. The biggest and most prominent point of contention from all these translations, as it turns out, every single playable character is 18 years old, with the exception of Mio, who is 19 years of age. This adds so much to many people's theory that we're starting to form after my lengthy analysis video was posted that this world is stuck in some sort of time loop or that people's actual ages and lifespans are tied to the flame clocks or whatever that the full circle that everyone has on their weapons is. We would have been understanding if Yuni as a high Antia was in her late 90s, heck maybe even younger, just to show that the high Antia blood is extremely dilute or if Lance as a Machna was two or three thousand years old, or heck if Senna was described as being awake for three years, given she's a blade and not enough info is known about her. But no, they're all relatively the same age and they're all listed in their earlier biographies as being childhood friends to one another. It's completely jarring. What does the age difference also imply about Mio, is she simply one year older than them and that's that, or has she done something to give her an extra tick for her life? There's a lot of new theories about Mio I'd like to bring up at this point. One is that there's new technology that has simply allowed Blades to live lifespans more akin to humans, and that maybe could tie in with Senna. Two is that Mio is a blade that was awoken by Nia, as some Blades can bear forms that look closely to or have traits similar to or exactly alike to their driver that they've bonded with. The best example being Laura and Hayes from Torn of the Golden Country. The third is that as a flesh eater, the blade she ate and devoured was Dromark, which is probably the one I agree with the least. Alas, these are just questions that are just going to have to wait till we have more information. There are a couple of other things that I want to talk about with relation to the Nintendo of Japan tweets. The first is the fact that each of the characters were given a basic description of their weapons and fighting styles. Noah was described to boast impressive physical strength and have an almost samurai-like stance, a reference many people are alluding to ties with Faye's martial style from Xenogears, 
His long hair is also tied up in a ponytail notwithstanding. Lance, meanwhile, has been friends with Noah since he was a child and will protect his friends at any cost, even at the cost of his own life. Because of that, his reckless actions are worrying. A typical big bulky protector stereotype, but again, friends with Noah since childhood just shows just how much the races of Xenoblade 1 are all somehow having the same lifespan, despite Machina literally living thousands upon thousands of years as compared to the human equivalent Homs. They also reiterated that his sword can also function as his shield, and again I will gladly allude to Ryan's garter type weapons from the first game. Last on the Kevis side, Yuni is a Kevis soldier and a user of a staff which also functions as a gun. Nintendo of America specifically called it a gun rod, which is what I assume will be the official weapon type name in the western localization. She is a childhood friend of Noan Lands and seems to excel at healing in battle. So again with the childhood friends, again with the 18, but you know the focus on her seeming to excel at healing seems to mean she will peter out more towards the gun side of things if that thing is an ether rifle like Charla's, and hopefully better and we don't have to deal with the cooldown and waste a lot of time that Charla was plagued with. I personally hope that her stat spread and kit also allows her to be played as either DPS or support, similar to how Lance is seemingly likely to either act as a DPS or tank. In any case, the descriptions of the three Kevis side give off the impression that these three will have a Shulk, Ryan, Sharla vibe, the quintessential team comp that many players of Xenoblade Chronicles 1 know well for the bulk of the early game. Next on the Agnes 3, the 19-year-old Mio uses twin rings and is extremely agile, great at avoiding attacks. While she seems to draw hope from others, she seems to hold her own concerns. I'll talk about the avoiding attacks shortly, but I just want to say that Holding her own concerns makes her feel even more prominent as the main secondary protagonist, because it alludes to having an arc or something for her in the game where she's going to be relying on other characters, or other characters will likely push her on and support her to be open and grow more. Now with regards to avoiding attacks, this is clearly an illusion that she might be a sort of dodge tank, and if that's the case she will be a primary protagonist and one of the first few ones that really is a tank as compared to being some sort of physical DPS with a sword. So pretty interesting stuff to think about. Now then, Tyon uses the mysterious paper-like weapon known as the Katashiro, and he's taken a liking to calling it Mondo. Only 18, he's quite the skilled tactician who supports his allies, working alongside Mio and Senna, who both trust his insight and judgment. He otherwise has a cheeky personality, and is sometimes too cautious, getting easily over annoyed and impatient when he doesn't understand something. This is a better work on the stereotypical tactician trope, and I hope he can pull it off and grow more than his similar trope counterpart of Akos in Xenoblade Chronicles 2. Also, I love that the main little guy is named Mondo, but it may allude to the fact that the weapons of the game aren't super interchangeable, or maybe Tyon's weapon will swap around and Mondo will just persistently stay, or maybe he'll get minor tweaks to represent the different weapons. Either way, I highly doubt that the weapon named Katashiro will be used in the western localization. Just please don't call it something stupid like Battle Origami, please. Lastly with Senna, 18 years old as well, she's known for using a massive hammer. She works with Mio and uses her superhuman strength. She looks up and loves Mio and sees her as an older sister. This definition may well play into the reasoning behind why Mio is just one year older than the rest of the group. But again, the different races all being roughly the exact same age is still a point of concern. Although Senna has a cheerful and energetic personality, she's shy and lacks confidence in herself around others. A cute little quirk for her, the small girl big weapon stereotype, and hopefully this will add to some moments of relief or humor throughout the game. Alright, with the characters out of the way, the other main point that Nintendo Japan posted about, we've seen many of these giant robots that the game has to offer in the trailer. Some of these are mobile weapons that have been termed Iron Giants on both sides of the war. Both Kevis and Agnes have dozens of these, but notably, some serve as a place of living. Some have purposes and roles such as weapon manufacturing instead of just pure combat. But the real kicker and meat of the post, the Iron Giants where soldiers can reside in are known as colonies, and they're numbered. This is an absolute nod to the colonies of Xenoblade Chronicles 1 where by the time we play, only Colony 9 and Colony 6 are able to survive and make it through, and predominantly consisted of Homs and Nopon until Colony 6 became a global haven for all the people. 
This is an absolute huge nod for XC1 fans, and I can't wait to see how they adapt the role and use of colonies in Xenoblade Chronicles 3. And that is everything that Nintendo of Japan official Twitter has posted about and has roughly been translated by fans. While that's mostly everything I wanted to talk about, I also wanted to bring up one last fan theory, and this one is entirely my own. I know that Xenoblade Chronicles 3 is putting together the worlds and stories of Xenoblade Chronicles 1 and 2, but what about Xenoblade Chronicles X? It might not make the most sense because if their Earth was destroyed by unknown alien entities as compared to a militaristic rebel group that was fighting around the beanstalk in Xenoblade Chronicles 2, but what if it wasn't destroyed by them, but by Claws in a last ditch effort to salvage humanity? Again, that part is just my own headcanon, and it doesn't make the most sense. We visibly see Earth get blown up in X, but if it's time for a retcon, or just a visual retcon at the most, that might just be it. The gist is roughly the same. Both had major battles in space before the Earth slash universe was ultimately destroyed slash remade. What if the reason Mira was not on any star maps is that they were somehow tossed back to a reformed Earth after the worlds merged back, and they're just on another side of the planet, meaning Mira and Ionios are one and the same. Heck, there are even Telethia on Mira, granted only the two, and the Nopon are present, albeit with some minor differences. It's almost a meme how much planet Mira has something going on about this planet, and the setup for Ionios has us asking very specific, time-oriented questions. As far-fetched as it is, I really personally can't rule it out, although it may just be because we know nothing of Ionios, and therefore it is very vague, while we know a fair amount of planet Mira, which is purposely written to be very vague. There are two other points as well. A DLC character in Xenoblade Chronicles 2, Elma thinks at one point, just what's the reason we've all gathered, or were gathered here? It could just be that the non-canon DLC has its own hijinks, but maybe there's more to it in having all three existing protagonists meet together at one point. Another line also sticks out to me from Xenoblade Chronicles X, the final line of the game, this story is never ending. Could have a tie-in with the idea of Ionios meaning never ending, or heck even the Ouroboros and their new theories of the world being stuck in a some sort of time loop. Again, these are all just my own theories, and my own personal headcanons certainly contribute to me wanting to just push it out, but I really wanted to talk about them and give you my own take regardless. And that is finally all I have to say about the trailer that I know about or all the new theories that have popped up so far on the internet, again using only prior Xenoblade games as a reference. I know it was quite a lengthy follow-up to an already lengthy analysis video, but that just goes to show how much love I have for this series. But please, tell me what do you think? Do you have your own thoughts on anything I brought up, or is there something you think is interpreted differently? Let me know in the comments below. You can also reach me on my Twitter, where I'm far more active on a daily basis. If you enjoyed this video, please consider liking it and subscribing to my channel, where I plan to keep talking about and playing many different kinds of video games, particularly those I resonate with and love deeply. Again, thank you very much for your time, and as always, have a great day.